Coming up in this week's show, we find out if a Fiat 500 is a suitable car for a student to learn to drive a manual car. German and Japanese model vehicles go head to head. And is overfilling your car's engine with oil harmful? Hello and welcome to Buyer's Guide. We'll be tackling a fresh batch of your vehicle related questions and queries once again. And here to help us this week, Gugu Masuku from 224 Wheels, ZA, and GC Lukele from BMW Santa. Welcome back, gentlemen. Thank Google, you, thank you, thank you. you first. Welcome back. <laughs> thank you, Segi. Nice to see it's you. Nice to see you. Again. How are you doing? I'm well. GC, what's up, man? I'm glad to accompany you. <laughs> 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 He's accompanying me. We got the award-winning uh, GC here, yeah. and the motoring journalist entrepreneur here as well. Yeah. So good. We got the brains trust in, and then we've got Segi. Remember, if you like the panel's advice, you can send us an email to buyersguide at ignitiontv.co.za. And please include as much detail as you can, plus a clear picture of yourself. Now we're going to kick off things with a question from Malkit. He's almost 18 years of age, and he plans to purchase a second-hand 2014 Fiat 500 as his first car. He needs a reliable vehicle for daily university commutes of about 50 kilometers. Both Malkit and his 18-year-old brother will use it to learn manual driving. Malkit seats advice on the Fiat 500's reliability, parts availability, service quality, and suitability as a starter car. He intends to keep the car for four to five years to learn manual driving properly. Well, let's hope he learns a bit quicker than four to five years to drive a manual car. Google, let's start with you. A 10-year-old Fiat year old. 500. Well, that's the first issue, right? He's looking for reliability in a 10-year-old Fiat 500. I don't think he's going to find that. And then he's looking for five years of ownership, trouble-free. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll put him in, in what we always put people in. Not that. Not that, no. <laughs> Not that. Suzuki Swift. You know what? We uh, uh, need, it's a newer car. We need to remember, right at the outset, mm. they want his young Branga brother is learning to drive a manual. You know what happens when people are learning to drive manual? I hope daddy's got lots of money for new clutches. Clutch on ah. that Fiat 500. Yeah. Now the problem with the Fiat 500 as well, it does have actually quite a small clutch. And that's one of the um, uh, parts that we change a lot on Fiat 500s is, is the clutches. They, tend to, they don't last a long time. So well, he hasn't given us a budget of, of whatever. So GC Fiat 500 would be most probably, this would be around about an 80, 100,000 Rand car, I would imagine, somewhere around there. So, so yeah, I, I also agree. I, I agree with Gugu that I think it's, I can see the appeal. Fiat 500, it's a cute mm. little car. And maybe there's been influence. Maybe there's someone at, at uh, campus that's got one. Yeah. And it's like a cute little car. But it's not the car, it's the first brand or car you, you think of when you say reliability, everyday usage, 50 kilometers. All those qualities. He's going to miss a lot of his classes, that's for sure. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> yeah, so I, it's certainly not as a start. Um, yeah, we have to, uh, I've heard that people don't like the cars that we recommend here because they tend to be repetitive, but they're repetitive for a reason. For good yeah. reason. <laughs> it's, it's because, because it is the car <laughs> suitable for the job. Yeah. Well, let's not, let's not mention any Suzuki's today. How about throwing in something else? So like... Kia Picanto is not a bad yep. car. Mm. Hyundai i20s, even a Hyundai Accent. I mean, I know they're not cute and funky like the Fiat 500, but the Fiat 500 is going to cost you quite a bit in maintenance. It's most probably going to leave you on the side of the road a couple of times when you're going to university because it's 10 years old. I don't yeah. know, you know. He you says know, he wants a two door car. I would think maybe you should yeah. just consider a VW Up if you want a two door. Up yeah. is a good idea. It's a good yeah. idea. A little car. You know, there's the Up. Um, you can buy, a, like you guys mentioned already, a Picanto or an i10. No, it's well, another car. faithful a Honda Jazz. <laughs> well, Honda Jazz is brilliant, if you could, but you struggle to find one in that sort of price bracket. And the problem is, if you find in that sort of price bracket, you're not going to get one with 65,000 kilometers. No, you're right? not. Mm -hmm. yeah. But so I'd rather buy a, a, a Honda Jazz with 150,000 case than, than a Fiat <laughs> with 65,000. 65, I think that just proves the point you're trying to make, GC. I, I we recommend certain cars because... They're kind of bulletproof. Well, this is why we have experts here, because we've been in the industry. I mean, between us here, we've probably got 100 years' worth of experience. And, and we know what is good and bad, because we've had, we've had all the tears. So we wouldn't recommend a Fiat 500, especially a 10-year-old one for you. So I'd rather go out and look for something, you know, an i20, a, a Kia Picanto, a Honda i10, Honda Jazz, if you can find something like that. These are cars that are generally cheap to run, uh, fuel efficient, and 
they're good cars. Yeah. You, you know, you don't want to have to have problems all the time. So our answer to you is no, don't look at that car. Look at some of the other recommendations that we, we would suggest. But you know, he never said anything about guys, tell me anything else that I need. We just threw it in there. So we just threw it in there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to move on. <laughs> Our next viewer is Peter. He's looking for a small, reliable van, primarily for commuting around town and for gardening purposes. He's considering purchasing a 1993 Corsa Utility 1.4L 5-speed van with 87,000 kilometers on the clock for 93,000 Rand. Peter is curious about the availability of parts for such a bucky and whether it would be a good buy. According to the private seller, the engine is in excellent condition with the service record and all paperwork and licensing are up to date. Well, I suppose that's what you would expect normally, guys. Right. Google, if you are selling me a car, would you ever tell me, look, this is a, a problem? Piece of junk. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> also, I mean, it's and a you're a private seller, hey, no. private deal. 93 car with only 87,000 Ks on it. Yeah, no. There, there, there's red flags here. Yeah. It sounds too good to be true. When basically. last did you have a, uh, what is that, a 20-year-old car coming to you with... Mm. It's a 30 year old car, not a 20 year old car. 93. Oh, my maths is bad. Yeah. See the grey matter. It's a 30 year old so car. So you're just doing 1, uh, 3,000 kilometers a year? On 87,000 Ks. So, so there's two ways of looking at this. The one is... It's, it's a unicorn. It's an absolute okay. unicorn, in it which is. case I should buy. But yeah, we, we as, as you've said, the experiential view says... Mm -mm, sounds too good to be uh. true and as we often say in this industry if it if it does it probably is yeah uh, so I would just check um, yeah I look for something that's sort of you know we often say to customers that there's a, there's an upper band and lower band of what is reasonable to expect you don't expect a utility vehicle that's 30 years old to have, to have 87,000 yeah. kilometers okay the next thing that, that, that I think you missed out the one the flashing me is is it's 93,000 Rand. Now, you, you could buy a 10-year-old a, a Chevy, yeah. Chevy Utility. Yeah, for that kind or of Or NP200, a later model NP200. For, for that kind of money. For 90 grand. So, for me, 93 Corsa Utility shouldn't be selling for more than 50 grand. Mm. And if, it's in, if it, this mileage is true and, it's, and you can prove it and you can see from the service records and everything and it's 100% correct, I wouldn't pay more than 60 grand. Yeah, negotiate that price. Yeah, it's absolutely. way too much. It's way, way, way too much. And hopefully by the time you see this, you haven't gone out and, and, and purchased it because you'll be paying way too much. The way to also find out what the value, how right it is, is find an insurance company because you want to have it insured and say, yep. look, I've got this 1993 <laughs> cost of utility. I want to insure. How much say, no, we cost can't me? insure it. Sorry, sir. And what would the insurance value be of the vehicle? They'd say to you, okay, the insurance value would be we can insure it for 50,000 rand. Yeah. Uh, and you say, no, I want to insure it for 93,000 Rand. They're going to say, no, we can't because it's not worth that value. So that's what you've got to look at. As a vehicle, it's a good vehicle. You know, if you can get a, a cost of utility of 93 and it's in good condition, not bad. But one, the mileage is doubtful and, and the price is uh, dubious. So um, rather than find something else that's not so sketchy. All right, stay tuned because after the break, German and Japanese vehicle models, they go head to head. And we examine the long-term ownership prospects of an Isuzu KB300 versus the KB250. You're watching Buyer's Guide and if you just joined us, welcome to this week's show. Nathan and his wife are looking into buying their first car within their budget of 400,000 Rand. The options include the VW Polo TSI, VW T-Cross and Mazda 3. Nathan is concerned that the Polo TSI is a high-risk vehicle and the T-Cross has a new facelift coming. They're wondering if they should wait and buy the outgoing model of the T-Cross at a lower price once the facelift of the T-Cross arrives or should they just opt for the Mazda 3? I know what I would do. What would you do, Google? I would wait. I would wait all day long then get that T-Cross for a better price. It, it's, it's essentially a Polo, but a Polo on stilts. Very nice car. Get a good deal on it. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. GC? Sure, this is a tough one. <laughs> I do like that T-Cross. I think it's a really nice car. But, so I, I suppose it depends how long they're willing to wait. Otherwise, there's always the used car option. Go for a demo. Try and negotiate your way on, in a demo of a car. It often helps if you could find like just a year old car, so year old calendar year, so maybe like a December, November car that's now depreciated because it now has a book value. 
try and negotiate a deal on a car like that. But uh, the T-Cross I really like. I think it's really cool. Nothing wrong with the Mazda 3 either, by the way, but I think the T-Cross just, because yeah. it's, a, it's a crossover, you kind of feel like you're getting an SUV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but let me, let me tell you something Adam always says, and I have to agree with him. How's that, Adam? Have oh, wow. That's, that's <laughs> and, and his take on it is the run out, the run out of the last model mm -hmm. is nearly perfect. Mm. All the little niggles Gremlins. and things have been ironed out. With a newer model, you don't know what you're going to be getting. 100%. Whereas you can, and you, like you said, you can negotiate on the run out. They have specials and things like that. So my advice to him would be, if you want a T-Cross, go buy a new one, but the model that's now going to be stopped. Yeah. Mm. And, th and, and to tell you go. what, that's sound advice from Adam. Yeah. Way to go. 100%. Couldn't agree more. Um, I'd buy the Mazda 3. <laughs> because <laughs> I know in, be in 10 years' time, <laughs> I, c I would still have it. And it would be still going perfect. And yeah. it wouldn't have yeah. cost me a fortune to run. And mm. I mean, the T-Cross is, uh, I get you, it is, a, it is a cute, funky car. But German cars are expensive to maintain. Mm. Yeah. And if so you want a uh, T-Cross, buy the run out. But, if but I like what Adam suggested on the Mazda 3. But if you want a T-Cross, fine, buy a T-Cross. But I would, when you're at the dealer, try and get an extended warranty at the same time. So if they're giving you a three-year warranty, see if you can extend that five, five years. years. Get a value add, yeah. Yeah, do a value add onto it. Pay for it now so that you know for the next five years your maintenance costs are zero. You've paid for it when you bought the car. And remember, if you pay for it now in 2024, and, you know, as opposed to, f say, three, four years' time when you want, want to... Um, pay for the maintenance then. There it's more expensive. So you're paying 2024 prices, not 2027 or 28 right. prices. Mm -hmm. So that's that. then you get, and even if you wanted to sell the car in let's say three years time, you won the lottery and you want to sell something, you can uh, you know, always sell it with the warranty. And those are the best cars, eh? When Absolutely. they come to GC, Absolutely. I've got this car I want to trade in. It's still got warranty. It's still got everything. It's perfect. Or even get upgrade your, so I think those cars come with service plan. You can upgrade to a full maintenance. And again, yeah. that's a value add. There you go. Yeah. So those are the, the price of cars these days. Even if you win the lotto, you won't be able to afford it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're going to move on. And uh, Dingan recently bought a 2009 Isuzu KB250 following buyer's guide advice. Well, oh, no. Somebody listen to us. Well done. And see, see what he says. He's pleased with his purchase. He's driven it at about 15,000 kilometers now. And he's concerned about the daily power output. And he's considering... 28 or 2011 KB300 for more power while aiming for similar reliability and longevity. He also wants to know about maintenance costs and spare parts availability compared between the 300 and the 250. Google, would it make any difference? I don't think so. I've driven those cars. Um, they, they just feel underpowered. That's just, yeah. yeah. The 250 you're talking about? Or both? And I've driven the 300. It, it feels underpowered. It's, it's 120 kilowatts, 360 newton meters. So, so Dingan shouldn't be it's, it's bothered. Not much. Moving onto the yeah, KB300. It, it won't be much. You should just stay with these 250. Mm. Well, I think the thing here is to go and drive a 300. Yes. You've been driving that 250. The 250 is a very good, reliable vehicle. Hard-working vehicle. But whenever somebody wants that on the show, I'm sure you've seen us say, it's a great vehicle, but it struggles to pull the rice off a, you know. What skin off a rice pudding? Rice pudding, I think pudding yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the 300, go and drive it and see, is it worthwhile spending? Because it's going to cost you a bit more money mm. to go and get a more powerful bucky. Uh, than the 250. See if it's that better. We'll just go buy a Toyota Hilux, you know. Yeah, once. <laughs> yeah, Done. once. Just go buy a 2.8 GDX. Yeah. And then it's sorted. Yeah. Or GD6. What did I say? GDX. GD6. Yeah. That was wrong. Yeah. yeah. But you know what I'm saying. So, you know, have a look at it. In terms of the 300 and the 250, in terms of reliability, parts of availability, and service costs, they would be the same. There wouldn't be any difference. So, uh, the 300 would be a little heavier on diesel. Mm. Yeah, the 250 they, you know, is like sip, runs on a yeah, smell of but oil. But still, like. it's still very, very fuel efficient. So for me, I would just keep the 250 because you end up, what you actually end up paying for, just live with the power and just drive slower. Now, GC, unfortunately, doesn't have a BMW Bucky or you'd be... <laughs> yeah. Well, so I, I was just going to bring up the perspective of <laughs> trying to change a car too soon after purchase. Yeah. We get it all the time. It's going to cost you money, yeah. People always assume that it's far less cost than it is. The cost, if there's finance involved, of settling the finance and the depreciation you've taken on this car and then starting finance all over again. Yeah. By the time you've done that whole maths, even if there's a significant jump in power, it's going to cost money. And in a year, you're still paying off the interest. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And people and forget that. And you know why BMW don't have a bucky? 
Yeah, it's badly made wheelbarrow. Ah, oh, no, wow. because they're living up to its acronym. <laughs> the reason why BMW don't have a bucky is because they looked at what happened to the Mercedes and they learned to lesson <laughs> yeah, quickly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll be taking a short break while GC beats me up, but when we return, we help a viewer who purchased a vehicle that exhibits defects after purchase. And we find out is overfilling your car's engine with oil harmful? Welcome back to Buyer's Guide. Matabo is from Boxburg and he bought a Renault Sandero T900 Expression, which he soon revealed multiple defects like an oil leak, faulty headlamp, and engine warning light, suggesting prior accident damage. Yeah. Despite returning the car to the dealership, no resolution has been reached. The car remains at the dealership with monthly payments still being debited. Matabo seeks assistance in resolving this frustrating situation promptly. GC, you're the man today. You're the man, yes. Yeah, yeah, you're the man today. So first of all, you should have watched Buyer's Guide because... <laughs> so probably Good one, GC. You back next to week. That guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a situation you don't want to be in. Um, I want to go back to a point you made earlier about relationships. It is so important to form a good relationship. Um, we often find that customers that are, un are antagonistic end up getting less. Yes. It's better to have a good relationship and rather have a cordial agreement with the most senior person at the dealership yeah. and just say, hey, listen, I'm unhappy. You cannot fix all the things. And I think the, the key pi uh, point in all of this beyond the unreliability is the accident. So that's grounds enough to say, hey, this wasn't disclosed to me and it's causing and it's potentially going to cause the car to be even more unreliable on this could we have an agreement, expect to maybe have a little bit of a you know, usage fee, don't expect to come out clean. If you can come out clean, great. Yeah. But if you, you can agree on some, you're better off losing some kind of money and saying goodbye to that car than ending up with a car that's going to so be. So buying a car from a dealership though as well. So I come to you now buy a car from you. What are the sort of guarantees that the Consumer Protection Act say? Is six months. Six months. So six months they've got to fix this vehicle. Correct. Now, it's got an oil leak. We don't know how bad the oil leak is. It could be a small oil It had a headlight that didn't work. Maybe it's just a headlight bulb. Those are small things, yeah. okay? But an engine light that's on, that could be a major problem. You know, it's the kind of thing you need to go back to the dealership and, and GCU quite correctly said, don't speak to the salesman. Who's the boss? Who's the owner? Who's the manager? Who's the dealer principal? Listen, I bought this vehicle so-and-so. You've had it for this amount of time. You've had more than enough time to fix it. If you haven't fixed it in this particular time, either you've got to take this vehicle back, refund me, or give me another vehicle. Would it help to go to the finance company? So let's say he's financed with West Bank, go to West Bank or whoever it is and say, listen, I bought this vehicle, I had it a, a week, I've taken it back, and they've had it two months, I'm making payments, and they're not fixing it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, also, in some uh, very unusual circumstances, could be in this situation, depending on what dealer it is, is if there's a car that's of similar description, and a lot of customers don't often know this, is that if it happens to be similar, and by luck, it happens to be the same year, the finance houses are quite happy to do what they call a substitution of goods. Yeah. So you can switch cars. So just change the number plate and the number, that's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. But, but we don't know if that's possible. Yeah. But again, <coughs> you will only know that if you go and speak to the head of the organization cordially. <laughs> yeah. May I stress, cordially. Go to the dealer and literally go in there and, and they must fix this problem for you and give you a time in which it will be fixed. And if they can't, they need to either replace the car or they need to refund you your money and cancel the deal and go somewhere else and get another car. Okay. Yeah. We're on to our last question, which comes from Kim. He is wondering if overfilling with oil is harmful to the engine of his 2016 Ford Fiesta. He performs his own oil changes and usually finds a small amount of oil left in the can after pouring. He ends up pouring a little bit left as well. How problematic is this? All right, so obviously if, if you've drained your oil and you, you fill it up, you've got a dipstick, and the dipstick is, is there for a reason. It's got a maximum and minimum mark on it. So what you need to do is, you know, I know you're chucking a little bit in if it's like 200 milliliters or something, it's not going to make a difference. But if your car takes, let's say, three and a half liters, and you're putting the other one and a half liters in, that's a major problem. You don't want to do that. The, the reason why it says maximum is because you don't want anything more than that because otherwise the oil ends up into other parts of the engine which shouldn't be, ends up in the exhaust system. Matter also fact, damages your seals. If you put too much oil in the car, like maybe two liters too much, 
you can actually wreck the whole engine. Yeah. So do not just use use the maximum as the maximum. It's actually better little to be less. a little bit less than too much. So if you look on the dipstick and it's one or two millimeters over the maximum, that's not a train smash. But if you've got it like, you know, 20 millimeters over the maximum of the dipstick, you are going to break your engine. So do not do that. Keep it to the maximum. It's there for a reason. And uh, I'm glad you got doing your own DIY stuff. Good. Good Keep going. Yeah. yeah. And just like that, we've come to the end of another episode. Gugu, GC, guys, it's great it's having pleasure. you again. Uh, thanks for joining us and thanks for putting up with Siggy and thanks for all we'll your, try. We'll try. your helpful advice. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Take shots at the bloody Indian at the end. <laughs> Until next time, remember to keep left, pass right and please keep it safe on the roads. <laughs>